so thankful whenever you can join us um, for our uh, video broadcast from uh, St. John's Lutheran Church, uh, 2415 Silas Creek Parkway. If you're not familiar with our ministries, we have a school attached to the congregation um, for children from preschool through fifth grade. And as you know, Forsyth County um, will be doing all online learning um, we will be able to have classes on site five days a week because of our smaller size, our smaller uh, classes, and we have more space that we can um, space out the children. So if you have children that you would like to have back in the classroom um, right away, or if you know someone who's considering that, um, uh, please uh, share with them the name of St. John's. Um, please do so quickly. Our classes are, are filling up because we've had a lot of phone calls since Forsyth made their, their decision. Um, but it's a, it, we are COVID safe um, based on North Carolina Health Department and on the CDC recommendations. Um, and uh, we have small class sizes, you know, so the teachers get to know each child individually and there's just a, a very warm and loving environment and they get to hear each week how much Jesus loves them. And so uh, we encourage you uh, to share that with uh, anyone who has children um, preschool through uh, K-5. Uh, thank you again for being with us um, this, this, well, whenever you're watching this, I, uh, I could say this morning. Um, uh, and today we'll be talking about uh, Matthew 13, where Jesus mentions that there is a pearl of great price. Thank you. Uh, the Old Testament reading for today's consideration is taken from the book of Deuteronomy in the seventh chapter, and it's verses six through nine. For we read, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. You are a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you. And because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, and he redeemed you from the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his promises and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is taken from the New Testament letters of Paul, the letter to Romans, beginning uh, chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. And um, this is chapter 8 in Romans, of course, is just one of the most encouraging and glorious passages of Scripture. Um, uh, and it, it's just blessed so many um, over the years. And so St. Paul is writing, and he says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Notice it does not say that all things are good, but that they work together for good. In other words, that for those who belong to God, he is working even in the midst of uh, things that are not inherently good to bring his good and his purposes uh, out of that, though we often cannot see um, how his hand is working. He says, for those he foreknew, that's you and me, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might become the firstborn of many brothers. Moreover, whom he predestines, those he calls, whom he called, those he justified, whom he justified, those he glorified. So what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? 
For he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, along with Jesus, also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, where he makes intercessions for us. And who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall trial or tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, or things present, or things to come, not height, not depth, not any other created thing, shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we say amen to that. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are in Matthew 13, uh, beginning in verse 44. Uh, Jesus has been telling parables, uh, stories that illustrate um, truths about the kingdom of God, and he continues in verse 44. He says, again, I say to you, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that was hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, and when he had found one pearl of great price, he sold all that he had and bought it. Again. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew it to the shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and separate the wicked from the just and cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things both new and old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Again, this morning we're looking at the parables that Jesus told in Matthew 13, especially the first two um, in today's reading, which both have the same essential meaning. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and then for the joy of it, he went and sold everything he had to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who then when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. How many of you would be filled with joy if you received a surprise inheritance of of millions of dollars. You didn't expect it, you didn't have to do anything to get it, and it completely changes your life. How about if you found some buried treasure in the backyard? Or maybe you were swimming and looking for oysters and found a giant pearl of great price. Jesus tells two parables that both make the same point, that a man comes into great wealth and he's filled with great joy. Now, now, there were no banks in the ancient Near East, and the villages were constantly being plundered by enemies and roving th thieves. So most people would hide in the ground any valuables they might have. They buried their treasure. 
The peasants didn't actually own the land. So the old saying was literally true back then that finders were keepers and those who lost their treasure through that were weepers. And since both parables kind of have the same meaning, the same primary meaning, I'm gonna focus mostly on the second one, which is known as the pearl of great price. But uh, let's pray first and ask the Lord to bless our time in the word together. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have promised that any time that we spend in your word, reading your word, hearing your word, studying your word, that your Holy Spirit is active there, blessing our hearts with the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. So come now again to us, Holy Spirit. Come through the word of Jesus Christ, that all who hear your word this day, O God, would either come to faith or be strengthened in true faith in Jesus. And we pray that all that we speak and all that we do gives glory to the one who loved us enough to die for us, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Certain Bible phrases have become common phrases in the English language, mostly from uh, the old King James Version. For example, a drop in the bucket comes from the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, where it says that all the nations of the world are like a drop in the bucket before God. A fly in the ointment is from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1, where it says, dead flies cause an ointment to stink. Escape by the skin of one's teeth comes from the book of Job. Scapegoat, bearing a cross, wolf in sheep's clothing, they're well over a hundred. And it might, you might enjoy doing an internet search, just looking for English phrases, common English phrases that come from, from the Bible. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Now one of those common phrases that comes from the scripture is the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price has come to mean something of tremendous, almost extreme value. I did a pearl research this week. Pearls are known to have been worn as jewelry as least as far back as the dynasties of ancient Egypt. It's their rarity and their lustrous beauty that has always made them so valuable. Pearls are known as the queen of gems and were an ornament often worn by queens and and only the wealthy. They're the only gem that's produced by a living creature, the oyster. White pearls are the most popular, but pearls also come in pink, green, and gray. Blue pearls are the rarest, and black pearls from the South Pacific are the most sought after. A story is told that Cleopatra had a wager with Mark Antony that she could hold the most expensive meal in history. So when the Roman ruler arrived, all that he saw in the hall were bare plates and a couple of glasses of wine. After he was seated, Cleopatra took off her two large pearl earrings and dropped them in the glasses of wine. And after the pearls dissolved, they drank them. And so she won the wager. From ancient drawings, it's estimated that the value of each of those pearls would have been over $9 million each today. The most valuable natural pearl in the world is called La Peregrina. Richard Burton purchased it in 1969 for $37,000. It sold at auction in 2011 for $11.8 million. That was quite an investment. The largest pearl ever found is called the Pearl of Puerto. It was found off the Philippine island of Paiwan by a fisherman, and he kept it hidden in his house his whole life as a good luck charm. And when he died, a relative found it in his house. The pearl is two feet long, one foot wide, and weighs 75 pounds. The second most valuable pearl was also found just off the island of Paiwan, and it's called the Pearl of Allah because the pearl itself is shaped like a turban. It weighs over 15 pounds and is worth about three and a half million dollars. So there truly is such a thing as a pearl of great price. But this is a parable. So Jesus is not talking about a literal giant pearl. So in the Bible, who or what is the pearl of great price. 
Well, there's a second thing I want to mention that is not the pearl of great price that Jesus is talking about. You see, the pearl of great price is the title of a collection of Joseph Smith's writings and is one of the Mormon church's three sacred texts. Those are the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the third book called the Pearl of Great Price. The Mormon church considers itself to be the one true Christian church on earth. All others are said to be deceived. Their desire is to be seen as the one true Christian church, and that's why their official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. In the early 1800s, Joseph Smith supposedly was visited by the angel Moroni, who is not one of the named angels in the Bible, and supposedly the angel told Joseph Smith that all Christian churches and denominations had become corrupt and had lost the true teachings of Christ. And so the angel gave him golden tablets, which, of course, only Joseph Smith could translate. And so thus Smith produced the Book of Mormon and later the Doctrine of Covenants and then finally the Pearl of Great Price. All of these books are filled with false teachings that contradict God's word in the Holy Scriptures, in my Bible and in your Bible. Therefore, those who hold to the basic Christian teachings of the Bible consider the Mormon church to be a Christian cult, a heretical church using the name of Christ, but teaching many things that contradict what Scripture teaches. You can easily go online and find many teachings of Mormonism that do not agree with the true Christian faith or with the Bible. So we're not talking about a literal monstrous great pearl. We're not talking about the writings of Joseph Smith that are called a great pearl. So who or what is the pearl of great price? Well, hang on. Hang on. We're getting there. A third thing I do not believe it is. I do not believe that the pearl of great price is the gospel. That the pearl represents the good news about Jesus Christ. However, that is a very common interpretation among Christians. And so the idea would be something like this. When a sinner finds the gospel of forgiveness in Jesus, it's so precious to him that he would give up anything else he had in the world to make certain that he possessed that pearl or that treasure of the gospel. A similar view, also very common, sees the treasure or the pearl of great price as Christ himself. That Christ is a treasure beyond all treasure, a value beyond the largest pearl. And Christ certainly is a treasure to we who believe in him. So this most common interpretation is that a believer, a disciple, should be willing to give up everything for the treasure that is Jesus Christ. You remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, who refused to give up his treasure, and he went away unsaved? But there's a major problem with this interpretation. The gospel, the good news about Christ, or the gift of Christ himself, cost you and me, cost the sinner absolutely nothing. The only thing a sinner needs to give up to have the treasure of forgiveness and Christ is his or her unbelief. The rich young ruler was lost not because he didn't give up his treasure. He was lost because he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Savior. Remember, friends, always, always remember we are saved by grace. And what is grace? Grace is a free, free, free gift from God. Nothing we have, nothing we do, nothing we give, nothing we are could ever purchase our forgiveness in Christ. It's free. So what or who is the pearl of great price? It's not a huge gem. It's not a book of false teachings. It's not the gospel, the good news of forgiveness, and it's not Christ himself. What is it? 
Here's the key to our understanding. What are these parables talking about? Are they talking about you and me and what we have to do? That would be a law parable, right? Are they saying that we have to give up everything for Jesus? If they're saying that, we're lost because we can't do it. And it's not a matter of just giving up our earthly treasure. We can't give up our sinning. We can't even offer God our whole heart. Certainly not a clean one as we talked a couple weeks ago. No, each of these parables tell us right at the beginning of the verse what they're about. It says the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Those are interchangeable, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. These are kingdom parables. And what is the kingdom of God? It's wherever God rules as the king. And where do we find that rule of God? In believers. In those who have come to trust in and believe in God our Savior. You and I are in the kingdom right now. You and I will be in the kingdom with God after this life. You and I will be in the kingdom of heaven forever. The kingdom is all those who believe in Jesus Christ as God and King. And so the kingdom is the church the beloved bride of Christ, our bridegroom. And it's not the church that you and I see with our eyes. Remember last week, Jesus said, we can't tell who is in the kingdom. And he told that parable right before he told the two we're looking at this Sunday. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is the church, the invisible church, made up of all true believers. In these parables, just like so many others, Jesus is the man. The treasure, the pearl of great price, are the children of God. Isn't Jesus the one who gave up absolutely everything to have this treasure, this pearl of great price? That's exactly what the Son of God did. He gave up his glory. He gave up his seat on the throne. He gave up the worship of angels. He gave all that he had and all he was so that people would, through faith, become his treasure, his pearl of great price. Ephesians 5 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Philippians 2 talks about how Christ humbled himself for us. Christ Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, he humbled himself, and he became obedient even unto death on the cross. Jesus sold himself into sin and death to save his pearl of great price, his church, you and me. First Corinthians Paul 6, Paul says to believers, you were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. In Acts 20, Paul is speaking to the church elders, and he says to them, Be shepherds of the church of God, which Christ purchased with his own blood. First Peter says, We were purchased, not with silver or gold, but with something far more valuable, his precious blood. Remember the acronym, GRACE, G-R-A-C-E. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches are free. His riches of forgiveness and eternal life are free to you and to me, but Christ purchased them through his humiliation and his suffering and his death. God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, don't misunderstand. This does not mean that you and I are so intrinsically wonderful, so intrinsically valuable that we were worth 
the Christ life and death. God forbid we should ever think anywhere near anything like that. God forgive. It simply means that when Christ has sought us out, when Christ has found us and given us the gift of faith, we become his treasure. Who was the lost treasure? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Who does the seeking? Jesus, who said, I came to earth to seek and to save that which was lost. He's the shepherd who seeks the lost sheep, and it is not the other way around. Remember also how frequently I remind you that the key to understanding something in the New Testament is often found in the Old Testament, right? We talk about these connections. Listen to these passages where God is talking about Israel, about God's children, about the Old Testament church. Exodus 19, God says, you will be my treasured possession. Deuteronomy 14.2 says, Out of all the peoples on the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. Deuteronomy 26, The Lord has declared to you this day that you are his treasured possession. Over and over, the people of God are called God's treasure. Jesus sold himself so that we can be his precious treasure, his pearl of great price. We're told in Matthew 13 that when Jesus spoke these two parables, it was after he had left the large crowds, and now he was speaking only, only to his disciples, his followers, his believers. And it won't be long before the Lord will suffer and die and leave them. And it won't be long before they're going to be persecuted and hated for their faith. And what comforting words for them to hear and to remember, no matter what the world thinks of us, and no matter how the world treats us, that we are and always will be our Lord's treasure. To him we are a pearl of great price. And Christ is the man who with all the angels rejoices when the lost treasure has been found. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I confess that we can't even wrap our heads around the idea that the, <clears throat> the perfect Son of God would, would die for sinners such as we are. And we are so thankful for that grace, for we are so unworthy. But even beyond just that that act of sending Jesus in love for us is that once you have brought us to faith, once we have received your love for us in Christ, that we go from being sinners in your eyes to being treasure in your eyes, to being, as the Old Testament says, the apple of your eye a pearl of great price. Lord, we confess that in this world we do not often feel valued. The world does not look upon us as rich or something to be adored or lifted up, but that's how you see us because you love us in Jesus Christ. And even though we can't understand that tremendous love that you have for us, we are so thankful for it. May we always be encouraged that to you, we are a treasured possession. Amen. Yeah, be seated. Francis has a piece for us before we go.
Hey, join with me at home in prayer. We're going to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and always fill you with his peace. Amen. Again, thank you for listening in. Uh, for those of you who um, were attending Bible study here at St. John's um, prior to the COVID, we were studying the Gospel of Matthew, and we had just about reached Matthew 13. And so uh, last week's portion that I preached on was from Matthew 13. This week's was, uh, I believe next week's from Matthew 14. So um, we're in the middle of the lectionary, and the lectionary happens to be in the same place we were when Bible study concluded. And so you, we're kind of picking up where we were in that Bible study and moving through Matthew uh, again together. So um, continue to read ahead in, in those ver chapters, Matthew 13, 14, and 15. And uh, next week, we will explore God's word again together, and we know we'll be blessed. Thank you.